Hello my precious little dragons, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. Today I have created my own tag, yay! <laughs> this has been something I've been wanting to try for a while. So I came up with the bookshelf tropes tag. It's just one of the tags where you search your bookshelf for books that fit the prompt and all of the prompts are informed by different literary tropes, whether they're archetypes or plot tropes or something similar to that. So uh, let's just go ahead and get started. So number Number one is the broken hero trope. What book in your collection is the most battered and worn? So I am not counting in this my antique books are at my mom's house. So this is just the books I have here with me. And that would definitely be Eldest by Christopher Paolini. Um, as you can see, this book has seen better days. It is held together with tape and the cover is a little bit worn and yes, um, I have had this for a long time so it is very well loved. Um, which ironically, it's probably my least favorite book in the series but um, I'm just, I'm pretty sure I got this before I got Aragon for some reason. Anyway, it's in more shape. Number two is The Chosen One. Which book in your collection have you reread the most? If you've been here for any length of time you can probably guess what this is. It is Ella Enchanted by Gail Carson Levine or Levine. I never know how to pronounce her last name but I have reread this probably at least 10 times. I reread it a lot. It's just one of those comfort reads for me. I can basically read it in a day. It's just you know it's it's comfort for me. Number three, The Aged Wise Mentor. Which book in your collection has been with you the longest? So this one is between two of my children's books which I thought it was going to be one of the ones that I remember like us having but then I remembered I have these two that were my grandmother's and I remember reading them when I was really really little which ironically they're both kind of pop-up books. So this first one is well it's not really pop-up but they're both like interactive books. This one is The Merry Magic Go Round by Ernest Nister which it was a reproduction of an antique book. So it has like different, you can tell how old it is, it has different kind of poemy stuff and then on the side, on, ah, this is so awkward, <laughs> um, it turns. So for every page has that. And then the second one, the second one is the Nutcracker and it's illustrated by Michael Welpley. So, you know, it's the classic story, which it has like, you know, the pop-ups and um, this one's broken, but he used to be connected to the door. So yeah, pop up. I'm trying to find a fun one. Yeah, like you could see like the, like he, yeah. Anyway, this is fun. Um, it's very fragile now because it's very old. Those are the two oldest ones I have in my collection. Like I, I don't remember precisely how long I've read them, but I remember reading them when I was or looking through them when I was very, very little. So um, they've been with me a while. Number four, found family. What book makes you feel loved and at home? I of course picked The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. This one makes me feel loved and at home, not just because of the content of the book, but because it does very much have that warm, fuzzy, the warm fuzzy fairy tale feelings um, but also just because it was such a huge part of my childhood it was such a huge part of getting that love of reading I remember listening to the audiobooks I remember um, reading them with my mom and of course you know if you've been here a while I've talked multiple times about my mom's adoration of C.S. Lewis and so just the Chronicles of Narnia in general but specifically The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has so many homey fuzzy warm memories tied up in it that it's just it's very much that essence of home. Number five, The Love Triangle. A series where you cannot choose your favorite book. To no one's surprise, Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. I cannot choose my favorite book because I cannot choose between Fellowship and Return of the King. I, I do like The Two Towers but it kind of has a little bit of second book syndrome but Fellowship is so perfect because it has the adventure vibes and you get so much of the Shire and it's just so like it's the fun questy part whereas Return of the King is just so epic on all proportions. You get the finality of Aragorn going to the throne and you get the beautiful resolution and I just I cannot choose so. Number six, Enemies to Lovers. What book grew on you over time? This one I'm going to have to give to Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. And the reason why I didn't like this as much at first is because I used to be one of those people that hated romance, which it's still not my favorite genre. Definitely it has to have something else to it. Like it can't just strictly be, well, that's not even true anymore because I've enjoyed a couple just straight up romances. But usually 
I like having some other type of commentary or something else that's happening and I really do tend to prefer having romance as like something that's intertwined into another genre but Pride and Prejudice is one of those classics that just grew me over time and especially as I kind of grew and realized that there wasn't anything wrong <laughs> with romance I just you know it was one of those things I was like ah it's too girly you know all that internalized misogyny that <laughs> you get as a you get as a kid but yes this grew me over time I just really got to love the way Jane Austen writes the way she built Darcy and Elizabeth's relationship the way that she also wove in some social commentary I just really really adore it now it's one of my favorite classics and it kind of fit because you know enemies to lovers trope and then I chose Pride and Prejudice eh. Eh. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Number seven, Soulmates. What book feels like it was written just for you? Um, so it was a repeat author. Um, Fairest by Gail Carson Levine. Fairest, as much as Ella Enchanted, is sort of my favorite. Um, and I've reread it the most and you know it's just it's got that hominess to me. Fairest was one of the first times I really felt seen in a book. And I actually I wrote a note um, on Goodreads like years ago to Gail Carson Levine and she responded which just made my heart so freaking happy. But I was I basically told her what I'm about to tell you. It really was one of the first times I felt seen in a book because Aza is tall and she's fat and she's not the prettiest and she's ridiculously pale and um the only thing that i didn't have that she had was the hitan hair which just looks like black because this is a retelling of snow white but she also has a gorgeous singing voice and i'm not about to say my voice is like gorgeous gorgeous like enchants people gorgeous but I do have a really strong singing voice and that was always kind of where I got my freedom I'm like you know I may not have the face or the body to be a lead actress but I have the voice I can sing and so seeing a character that had that much <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm getting emotional but like seeing a character that had so much of me and she still you know she still got the prince she still I mean she struggled like she had moments where she she's been kind of downcast her entire life so she struggles with accepting herself and she does kind of want to change which leads to some conflicts in the story but and that's something I deeply understand you know there's so many points in my life where I was just like if I could just be a little shorter if I could be petite because every especially especially because I found this at the time in my life when I was really involved in theater and I I was always cast as like the spinster old lady or you know just side character ensemble stuff like that and I would always look at the leading girls and be like I have a voice that can match theirs but I will never be a leading lady because I'm taller than all the guys and I'm fat and I, you know there's just I there was a lot of that and I it really got to me um, at certain points in my life where I just felt very worthless. For a long time I wanted to be an actress. I, that's what I wanted to do professionally and I just couldn't see how I could do it because I was like I will never get any roles and the only fat girl roles available are side characters or moms or the now we have the comedic plus size character um, like Rebel Wilson. <laughs> um, but yeah so seeing a story like Ferris, where you have a plus-sized kind of plain character who's dynamic, who struggles, but who is able to get the prince and fall in love and have a happily ever after just really, really got to me. Um, and you know, kind of gave me hope. So I realize that's a lot to kind of get out of a kid's book. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It really meant a lot to me, as, as you can see. So, um, yeah, oh my gosh. Um, I wasn't expecting to cry during this video, what the heck. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, eight, David and Goliath. Uh, so what little book, so short story, novella, has had the biggest impact on you? So for this one, I chose And Every Morning the Way Home Gets Longer and Longer by Frederick Bachman. Very little book, novella. And... If you haven't heard of it yet, it is a book about a grandfather who has Alzheimer's and it's from his perspective and you really see his struggle um, with losing his memory and it talks about his relationship with his grandson. It's just very tiny. I cried basically the whole way through. It's just, it's so beautifully written. It's so poignant. It just, it touched 
every part of my soul. It's so so good and it's something I still think about and I just I really love it. Uh, I decided to zoom in a little bit because I feel like I had too much space up there. Anyway. Number nine. Days Ex Machina. What book did you find at the perfect time in your life? For this one I had trouble but I ended up going with um, Aragon by Christopher Paolini and the reason I went with this and I know it's not quite as popular as it used to be but I do think this really got me into reading fantasy and of course you know I've read fantasy before I've read fairy tales before it wasn't that I didn't like them before but this was like my intro and it also kind of kick-started my writing a little bit because I saw this 15 year old homeschooled kid who wrote a novel and was able to get it published and really into oh, like really out to a lot of people I mean a ton of kids read this growing up and adored it. You know, it's there's a lot of tropiness to it. You can tell it's like a first novel written by a kid. There's it draws a lot of inspiration from other stuff, which doesn't bother me because I mean, Swahimas have been doing from time in memoriam. We take you know old stories, we retell them. So the fact that this is like based heavily off of like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars literally doesn't bother me. But it really kind of kickstarted that love of fantasy and dragons and writing and it just it felt like it clicked in to place at just that perfect time in my life I was like probably like third or fourth grade it just it really worked for me and yeah obviously I I really really loved it <laughs> um I think all four of them are signed Number 10, Acquired Poison Immunity, a book you hate to love, especially one that has problematic elements. So for this one, I actually have two for you. All right, uh, the first one is The Secret Garden by Frances, Fran Frances? <laughs> Frances Hodgson Burnett. And this one is problematic because it is very much that imperialistic Britain. So their portrayal of India, where Mary comes from, is not the best. It's still a classic story. I still love it. Obviously I own this gorgeous illustrated edition. I think there's a lot of valuable stuff in The Secret Garden, but it really is definitely... When was, when was it even written? When was The Secret Garden written? Okay, yeah, 1911. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely of its time. But looking at it with our 2021 eyes, um, we can definitely see all these problematic elements. And I did see... Um, a couple comments that it talked about it being ableist as well. I'd have to reread it to really see that. I, I'm sure it's in there. But I just didn't clock it as much as, you know, the imperialistic racist stuff. Um, but yeah, so there's that one. The second one, and this one hurts a little bit more because this one was actually one of my favorites for a really long time, is The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. It was my favorite because I loved the questy journey of it. I loved getting to spend an entire book in Narnia. I loved being able to see the adult Pevensies, you know, the, the four in their prime. I loved the way Shasta and Erebus's relationship developed and how they went from grudging to best friends, like, over the course of the journey. Like, there's just a lot in this book that I really loved. And it has a lot of the same issues that Secret Garden does, where it comes out of this uh, imperialistic stance. Um, is it Telmir? Telmir? Tel Telmarine is the name of the people. I can't remember. I think it's Tel Telmar. Telmar. Uh, Telmar is very definitely coded as Arabic and between this and the last battle it's not viewed very well or pleasantly which is kind of interesting given that you know the origin of everyone in like all of the humans in Narnia came from literally an English cabbie and his wife but you know genetic diversity and magic in Narnia I guess yeah anyway um in this specific book it's not looked on very fondly you see it's coded as very uh frivolous and you know that they worship Tosh who is not Aslan and you know so there's and just sort of night death portrayals um, you do get some dynamic characters, like Erebus is a dynamic character, but she also is decrying her homeland, so there's some problematic elements in it. It's still one of those ones that I'm like, it still has a place in my heart, but I can look at it now and see that there's problems with it. You know? You know? 
Number 11, The Antihero. So a book you're still unsure about or a book that you have very positive and negative emotions towards. Uh, this one is The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. I really loved The Hunger Games when I first read it and then I hated the whole series and now I'm very ambivalent. I still like this one best. I don't like the second two. I don't like dystopian and I will tell you why because it way hypes up my anxiety but just even with the book itself I I don't like the love triangle this is like your classic why I love triangle which obviously it doesn't get worse until later in the series but I still I'm still ambivalent about it because I think there was a lot of social commentary that Collins did really well I've seen a lot of good discussions on the book and so I'm like I want to appreciate it but I just don't. <laughs> I just, it's not me. It's not my vibe. It's not my thing. It, that's okay. But I'm still, you know, it's, it's that like meh, tug of war in me. Like, do I like it? Don't I? Why don't I? So that's why it fits in here because it's one of those ones I just don't quite know how I feel about it still after all of these years. But number 12, Accidental Marriage. So what book did you pick up randomly or not know at all before reading it that you fell absolutely in love with? So I'm going to go with Dragon Slippers by Jessica Day George. So this whole series I absolutely fell head over heels with. So I am pretty sure I just picked this one up randomly because I read pretty much every book in my library as a kid that had dragon on it. Dragon in the name and the title. So I just picked this one up casually because dragons. And I absolutely adore this series. It is such a good, I don't know if it's technical, it's middle grade, why? Probably more. Eh, it's more middle grade probably but I absolutely adore it I still reread it fairly often I love the friendship that develops between Creel and Shardis I just I like having books with dragons and humans being like equal and also friends like I, I tend to like the ones where dragons are more um, on the intelligent human side than ones where they're more just beasts um I love that Creel's smart she uses the skills she has to get ahead she's she's just a very fun character I love the way her life develops I love the way the course of the series develops it's one of the few series where I really really liked the ending like I just thought the series as a whole was really good but this was you know it started with just randomly picking up a book and I love it <laughs> So number 13, Cliffhanger. A book where you only own or have read the first book in the series. So this one is just own, because I have read the whole series, I believe. Um, it was granted a very long time ago and I barely remember what happened, but it's The Cry of Ice Mark by Stuart Hill. And I remember particularly loving the first book in the series. So it's kind of very much like a paranormal monster fantasy um, that's based on Iceland. Um, like Iceland Viking-ish Norse stuff. I remember really loving it, but it's the first one. This is the only one in the series I own. I should probably reread it at some point because literally I probably have not reread this since middle school. But I remember really enjoying it when I did. Number 14, Insta Love. A book you knew you'd love before you read it and you did. This one's a recent read, but The Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. I absolutely adore this one. I will be doing a book look on it at some point. I haven't yet, but I do have a review up over on my IG for now. <laughs> and spoiler alert, I absolutely adore this. It's so good. It has such good commentary. It's like, it's got adorableness, but it's also got grief and grit and social commentary. It's got a lot of stuff just jam-packed in this book. It's so beautifully written. It's so well done. And yes, I I knew I'd love it from the moment I read the description and it lived up to literally all of the hype. Number 15, Slow Burn. A book, what book took you a long time to read but was worth it? I'm going to go with Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. So this one, uh, once I got towards the end, I would say I read it a lot faster because I was really engaged, but I sp specifically started out really slow with this book um and it partially it's just the vastness of it because it is multi-generational it covers so much ground um, it's so in-depth and detailed and thoughtful it just it's really one of those books i feel like you need to take your time with it pays off it's so worth it it's so beautiful it's such a dynamic interesting familial story and i really do adore it but it did definitely take me a while to just settle into the groove of it. Just let it happen. Let it all unfold before me. It wasn't a book 
I loved immediately, but it was a book that was worth my time. Number 16, Arranged Marriage. A book that was gifted to you or specifically hyped up by someone you know. Um, so for this one, it wasn't gifted, but it was hyped up for actual years. Um, and that's Steelheart by Brandon Sanderson. And this was hyped up by my friend Stolen Micah for actual years before I picked it up and read it. And I did really enjoy it. Uh, I don't enjoy it as much as I enjoy Elantris and Warbreaker, which Elantris also would have been a good fit here. Okay, both of these. Um, they, Joel and Micah hyped up both of these, uh, Elantris and Steelheart, and I just didn't read them for the longest time. <laughs> but they were both worth the read. I still did really like Steelheart. I think I just didn't like the character's voice as much, but the actual like world building, of course, because it's Anderson, you know, he does, he does magic systems, which personally I count superheroes as a magic system. Like it, it counts. <laughs> But like he does all of that stuff super duper well. This book is really smart, really well thought through. Um, I just didn't vibe with the characters as much. And then Elantris, I vibed with the characters and the world building and the magic system and just everything about it was just amazing. I loved it. It was great. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't have waited literal years to read these. Number 17, Amnesia. So a book you don't remember buying or a book you read but can't remember what it's about. The Red-Headed Princess by Anne Rinaldi. This one is a book that I have read and I can't remember what it's about other than it's about Elizabeth I and her girlhood, I think. Yes. I remember reading it. I remember liking it. So I bought it because I remember that. I remember literally nothing else about the book. I think I read it probably in elementary or middle school, something like that. I, I remember nothing else about it. It's it's about Elizabeth the first. That, that's all I got for you. 18 Plain Jane. So a book that looks unassuming or has an ugly cover, but you really loved the story. And I'm going to go with Matilda by Ro Ro Roald Dahl. I cannot say his first name. Roald? Roald. Roald? Roald? Anyway, Matilda. I do not like this cover. I don't like the style of this cover. Uh, I think it's kind of ugly. It's not my favorite at, at all. It has the classic look, which makes it all the more unassuming. But the story inside is just classic and timeless and it's lovely. And I absolutely adore this little girl who has magic powers and she loves to read and she, you know, it's got the found family and she is able to have her happy ending away from her abusive stupid family. And I love it. It's so good. Um, and if you haven't listened to the musical yet, it is literally one of my favorite musicals. I love the entire thing. This, especially the songs Quiet in My House have my heart. I love them. Two left friends. 19. Friends to Lovers. So a book by an author you've read and loved multiple works from. So the book I'm going to go with here is Snowflower and the Secret Fan by Lisa C. And I have read two of her novels at this point, which counts as multiples. Haha. -ha. Why did I say haha? -ha? So I really appreciate Lisa C's ability to just write so viscerally and her descriptions are beautiful. Her prose is gorgeous. I love how much you can tell she just really appreciates um, the culture of the story she writes. Um, usually it's Chinese, but she's also done Korean. Like um, Island of Sea Women is Korean. Um, I don't know if she's delved outside of China and Korea, but like that's where her heritage lies and you can tell how much she absolutely adores the craft of writing, how much she loves writing stories about women whose stories wouldn't be told in history books, but she likes uh, creating these novels that puts women at the forefront and I just, I, she's so good I adore her writing. Very intense at certain points, um, she doesn't shy away from making you cry. And the very last one, The Empire, a book that you felt obligated to own because everybody else seemed to own and love it. I'm going to go with The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. And this one was one I saw hyped up so, so much for so long that I finally just broke down and got it. And I actually just finished reading it not too long ago and I really actually did love it. Um, so it was worth owning, so maybe it wasn't the best fit for Empire, but you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> I created the questions, I can do what I want. But I just really, I caved into the peer pressure, but for once it was worth it. Hey. <laughs> but I did buy it because everyone seemed to own and love it. I was like, what, what is the hype about? I want to know what the hype is about. I want to join the empire. <laughs> 
Okay, 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 okay. So that is all I have for you today. Feel free to do the tag yourself. I have listed all of the questions down below. So I hope you do it. If you do, please let me know. I would, if enough people do it, I might create like a playlist so people can see. But yeah, I would love to know what your answers are or if you don't wanna create a video and you just wanna let me know down below, feel free to do that too. Um, but anyway, so that's all I have for you today. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Um, if you like this video, please, you know, do those YouTuber things, liking, commenting, subscribing, turning on the notification bell if that flows your boat, whatever. I love you all so much. I hope you have an absolutely beautiful day. Stay magic, keep reading. Goodbye.